Well, welcome to the Natural Health Podcast, where we bring awareness of sustainable health in the business hustle space. The Natural Health Podcast is perfect for the high-performing business-minded individuals who want to work with their biochemistry to achieve success and optimal health. It's Friday, which means it's time for friends sharing <laughs> facts about health, business, and overall success. In today's episode, we talk to Jeff Chilton. Jeff Chilton, raised in Pacific Northwest, studied ethomycology at the University of Washington in the late 60s and started working on a commercial mushroom farm in 1973. During the next 10 years, he became the production manager responsible for the cultivation of over 2 million pounds of agarose mushrooms per year and was also involved in the research and development of shiitake, oyster, anoki mushrooms, which resulted in the earliest U.S. fresh shiitake sale in 1978. In, nine, in 1989, he started Namex, a business that introduced medical mushrooms to the U.S. national supplement industry. He traveled extensively in China during the 1990s, attending conferences and vi visiting research facilities and mushroom farms. In 1997, he organized the first organic mushroom production seminar in China. Jeff's company, Nemex, was the first to offer a complete line of certified organic mushroom extract to the U.S. nutritional supplement industry. Nemex extracts are used by many supplement companies and are noted for their high quality based on scientific analysis of the active compounds. Some interesting and fun facts about Jeff are that he absolutely loves fly fishing for trout. He loves to hike in the mountains and also kayak. Welcome to the Natural Health Podcast, Jeff. Hi, Mahela. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really happy to be here. You're most welcome. So all these activities, fly fishing, hiking in the mountains, kayaking, it sounds like you love spending a lot of time outdoors. Oh, I do actually. And, you know, I grew up in just such a wonderful place, Washington State in the U.S., in Seattle. And, and uh, you know, even, even when I was young um, in the Boy Scouts, getting out and, and learning how the, about the outdoors and uh, also going out and hunting mushrooms, too, because, you know, this part of the world is one of the best places for wild mushrooms. And, and you know, what's really cool about wild mushrooms is, it's like a treasure hunt. So you're out in the woods, you're walking in these beautiful environments. And when you find a choice edible mushroom, it's like finding treasure. And it's so exciting. And, and that just kind of was part of the stimulus for me getting into mushrooms later on because I went on into study mushrooms uh, in university. And my field of study was actually anthropology. So I was studying the use of mushrooms for food, for medicine, and in shamanic rites um, during university. Uh, but what do you do when you get out of university with a degree in anthropology? Well, in 1971 or two, not a lot, <laughs> not a lot of jobs. So I thought, well, I'd kind of like to learn how to grow mushrooms. So I went to the only mushroom farm in Washington State, applied for a job, got a job. I was there for the next 10 years, literally living with mushrooms. Wow. Wow. You can say there's a joke that we say here, you're a mushroom. You're always kept in the dark about things. So I guess you were kept in the dark for about 10 years. <laughs> uh, you know, that, that's really interesting because have you ever been to a mushroom farm? I actually haven't. I've grown mushrooms myself, but I haven't been to a mushroom farm. Okay. Well, well, the reason we don't really see a mushroom farm is because mushrooms in general are grown indoors, especially in the West, in big kind of warehouse-like rooms indoors. And on this particular farm, we actually used miners' lamps when we went into the rooms growing mushrooms. There you go. Wow. You're, real, you're really hunting for that gold. <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, you know, it's interesting because, you know, a lot of people think, well, mushrooms, you don't need light to grow them. Actually, you do. Mushrooms need light. It's just this one particular mushroom, and there's probably a few others that grows without light. It's the agaricus called the button mushroom. You see it in the stores. It doesn't need light to grow, but m most other mushrooms need light. Now, you always have to remember, mushrooms also need light high humidity, so they don't like direct sunlight that can dry them out. It has to be a moist environment. Then the sun is fine as long as it's not too hot and dry. 
Yeah, when I got my first box of mushrooms to grow, um, the gentleman said, put them in your bathroom. Um, in the bathtub, the ones in the boxes came and put them in your bathroom because it's humidity and all that. And I got some amazing mushrooms out of it. I didn't really know what I was doing. I did a lot of research on it. And I was like, I'm trying my best. I was like, when I cooked it up, I was like, I hope I don't die the next day. <laughs> <laughs> I bet they were oyster mushrooms, right? They were button ones. Button mushrooms, really? Wow. Well, you know, those are actually the hardest mushrooms to grow. Um, oyster mushrooms are much easier. But, you know, the, the idea is they need a humid environment. You've got to have 80% plus relative humidity. And so either you have some kind of a, a small tent greenhouse type, you know, setup or you know, the bathroom is kind of like, yeah, well, what, what am I supposed to do? <laughs> you know, move them out when I'm taking a shower or, or, and then leave them there and like sort of keep all the moisture in the air and, and like, oh yeah, what do I want to go in and use the bathroom? And it's all, you know, it's kind of. It's filled with it, mushrooms. It's, it's like, what's this doing here? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, the other thing is somebody say, oh yeah, well just take them down to your basement. Like, wait a minute, <laughs> you know, what if my basement is dry? It's not going to work, you know, but people think, oh, yeah, basement, it's got to be damp and, you know, that. But but really, the key is just they have to have a humidity, in, humidity environment. Otherwise, they will dry out and they won't uh, uh, grow any further. They'll just sort of stop and go, it's too dry. I'm not going to stand up any further. Yeah, a hundred percent. Well, there you go. So there's been a lot of key turning points in your journey to where you are now. And, you know, you're running an amazing business. You've started an amazing business, done so much research on mushrooms. But what made you, besides the fact of when you finished uni, you're like, well, I don't know what job I'm going to get. So I'm going to start at a mushroom farm. Was there any drive ever to be like, I'm really interested in mushrooms or, you know, the fungi? Well, you know what? My, my field of study really was the use of mushrooms um, for shamanic purposes. So, so that was of great interest to me. And look, it's the 60s. We're experimenting with a lot of things. Mushrooms were part of that. And, and so, so for me, I, I was, that was just fascinating. And, and, and you know what was interesting about it, Mahela, was that in, in Mexico, they're still utilizing mushrooms in healing ceremonies, and nobody knew that until the 1950s when a New York banker who was studying mushrooms worldwide and had a Russian wife who loved mushrooms and taught him that same love, they went to Mexico when they heard about it, and back into the mountains and in a sense rediscovered that this was still going on it was essentially hidden since the uh, spanish had arrived and suppressed it all back up into the mountains they carried on despite the spanish doing everything they could to stamp it out you know it's kind of like you, th you know whenever one religion you know, comes in and takes over from the other. The first thing they do is try to stamp the other one out. And that's what they did all across Central and South America. But can you imagine this? And then what, what I found as well was that mushrooms have been used for thousands of years in ancient religions as well. So, so it was just very fascinating to yeah. me. And, and so how do you, how do you take that and move forward with it and, make a living and everything else. And I thought, well, I'd love to learn how to grow mushrooms. So let's, let's just, uh, you yeah. know, go to a mushroom farm and get a job. And, and that just sort of started my whole career off, so to speak from there. Yeah, that's brilliant. Getting in the in the starting of how where they start the mushrooms. But I want to know a little bit about shamanic um, uh, reasons they use them. What was the main reasons why they were using them in the rituals and how were they using them back in the day? Oh, well, you know what? they were doing and this is this is in mexico how the what's called a curandera which is a native healer that's kind of like a, an herbalist in a way um they would <clears throat> first of all it was all done at night uh the their patient would be there and what she was trying to do in this case it was a woman she was trying to diagnose 
the illness of the person that came to her. And um, this is not to say that they didn't have access to other doctors and maybe not to the same extent that we would in the city or something like that. But, but um, the patient also took mushrooms. It's at night in a, a dark uh, space with maybe a, some candles, uh, altar, and then she is going into what we might call a trance, but let's just say she is bemushroomed, and so is her patient. And we're and not talking about will... button mushrooms here, are we? No. <laughs> <laughs> No, no. Were you talking about mushroom mushrooms? No, I'm not talking about mud, mud mushrooms. <laughs> I'm talking about mushrooms that actually are used, uh, you know, for shamanic or healing purposes. And, and so uh, they're called psilocybe mushrooms, actually. And, and so, so, you know, she is, and this is not uncommon. She's, she's chanting. She's got certain chants that she's using. She's also using percussion to get into a rhythm and a vibration, to get into a space where she can then um, somehow, and I can't tell you how, I don't know, she, she is trying to divine what is going on with this other person, what their illness is. And, and you know, she knows what the symptoms are. They've told her and so on. And, and then she's trying to see if she can heal the person. Now, look, a lot of illness even chronic illness can be psychosomatic, uh, um, and 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 that's always something when you you know, or even mental illness. Uh, so you could look at it. For example, today they're actually using these mushrooms uh, uh, in clinics. Doctors in the West now are using them for people with mental illness or people who have addiction issues. Um, so it, it is looked upon now as a breakthrough in, in Western medicine. <laughs> and here it is. She comes from a tradition where they have been using them for thousands of years. And the, all of her knowledge has been passed down from person to person, from healer to healer. So she has certain mentors that she's worked with. And, and, you know, we're talking about a village deep in the mountains that in the 50s, there were no roads in there at all. You had to get in there on horseback or walking in, literally no roads. It's deep into the mountains. I, I've been there to this village. Um, when I went, there was actually a road which was back in the early 70s, the first time I was in there. But, and then later on, that road got paved. Uh, so now it's, it's got vehicles and stuff back there. So it's changed a little bit. But no, they still, deep in the mountains back there, they still use these mushrooms for healing purposes. Yeah, wow. It's an actually beautiful story when you understand the healing process and having someone that chanting, the the clapping, you know, the whole experience. I think that's that's magical. That's absolutely beautiful. And there's so much healing that can occur there. And I'm actually really happy that we're finding that as a breakthrough now. I know it's a bit, you know, late enough. Not I shouldn't say late, but it's I'm so happy that we're seeing it as a breakthrough and we're adapting it. We're not just rejecting it. Yes. Well, you know, and, and unfortunately, what, what happened, because they were beginning to explore this in the early 60s, uh, and partially because of this discovery, um, um, besides that, the, also the discovery of uh, LSD. And so they, um, you know, psychologists, psychiatrists, physicians were starting to use these, especially for things like addiction and, and just um, trying to you know, people who had certain types of mental illness would, would uh, definitely uh, do very well on this. But then prohibition came in and, and that just stopped it. And nobody was able to get licenses to use it. And, and instead, they started putting people in jail, <laughs> which and, and, you know, it's interesting because, you know, when you look back in history, prohibition of these types of plant medicines has gone on a long time. That was a, a, in large part what happened during the Spanish Inquisition uh, and all across Europe during the plagues. They were prosecuting 
uh, natural healers, many of whom, most if not whom, were women. And, and, and it was a, a terrible time. And it's just like, and they stamp it all out, and then it sort of comes back because they can't get rid of it completely. And, and so right now we're seeing, you know, prohibition starting to be lifted. Uh, um, just like right now in Canada, they've they finally legalized cannabis, and now they, they actually will give you a license if you're a um, – medical doctor or or a psychiatrist you can actually get a health canada license to utilize these mushrooms with your patients in fact i just listened to a um clinical psychologist last week i listened to a, a, a presentation and he was talking about his practice and six uh, patients in particular and talking about the different things and how he used this and, and how it went and the benefits that he had with some and some that didn't. And, and so it's really fascinating. And I'm really happy that it's happening because, you know, can you imagine living under prohibition where, where you were subject to possibly being thrown in jail? Mm. They're mm. not killing you like in the Inquisition. <laughs> but it's prohibition and they can put you in jail. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's so interesting. And I'm so glad, like you said, there's individuals that are using it and it's becoming a bit more uh, mainstream in a sense, uh, definitely not fully mainstream, but it's getting there slowly. So I'm, I'm, I'm really excited to see where that goes in the next few years. But on the topic of health, I wanted to know what does optimal health look like for Jeff? What does that look like at the moment? And in that success also, what does success look like for you now? Well, you know what? Um, the foundation of health, in my opinion, is diet. You have to eat right. Um, that is so important. My, my diet is, I, I guess what I would say with it is, is it's a, a meat and vegetable with a certain amount of fruit. Uh, I I don't eat as many carbs as I used to. And part of that is because um, at my age, although I do get exercise, I'm also more sedentary than as a younger man. And, and also I'm not burning off excess calories like it would be. So I'm really, I, I used to be like, okay, dinner time, I've got to have a potato or rice or something like that. No, that's gone, long gone. My, my meals are like, 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 let's see, last night I had... Uh, corn on the cob, which is kind of a starchy vegetable, um, and uh, chicken, fried ch uh, a barbecue chicken, chicken on the barbie, right? <laughs> so that was <laughs> you had my, an Aussie my dinner. dinner. <laughs> That's right. And, and so, you know, for me, when I go to the store, i am got all sorts of vegetables that I'm buying. And, and again, I, I'm a meat eater, so I, I will eat meat and vegetables. And then I've got, I really love oranges. So I'm always got oranges around and, and I love apples too. So that's my basic diet, which again, I think is absolutely essential. And, and a part of that too is, is, you know, whether it's working or not in terms of uh, how your, your um, whole internal system feels, uh, how you're eliminating everything. That's all tied, tied into that. So diet is, is crucial. Second, I, I, spend an hour and a half every day in a, I have a nice little home gym. It's a, it's a weight workout. Uh, and then, you know, an hour of that and then 30 minutes on the floor doing exercises for my core. So hour and a half there. And, and look, that is sort of like every day. I don't care every day. I'm right there doing it. And, and, you know, that's something too, Mahela, where it's like, if I do that, I can always say, you know, yeah, I got something done today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. And true, consistency is key and especially exercise is, well, and like you mentioned two things, nutrition and exercise. These two things are absolutely key to achieve optimal health. Oh, absolutely. And, and then the other, the third part of that is walking. I So underestimated. My, my mantra is get out of your car, walk, get out there. You know, I'm not a runner, but I love walking. I would rather walk than be on a bike, actually. And, and I live in a community where we actually have a, a separated uh, walking path. We call it the multi-use path. 
you can bicycle on it, you can walk on it, you can skateboard on it, and it is completely separated from the road. So, so you feel like you've got your own path, and it's and it's paved. And, and I can walk to the beach twenty minutes to get to the beach, or twenty minutes walking into town. And then I've got a, a bunch of other woods walks around here that I can take. So, so as long as it's not raining, <laughs> which it during the winter it does a lot, um, I will be out and try to get out and walk every single day. Yeah, that's amazing. I love that. Getting in touch with nature, walking, eating right. I absolutely love that. Key to health. Breathing fresh air too. I mean, and, and just, you know, look, at my age, I have friends that are, their bodies are wearing out. And, and you know, I know people who've had knee replacements, hip replacements, and, and I haven't had any of that. I, I don't take any pharmaceuticals at all i know i've got plenty of friends that have are taking multiple types of pharmaceuticals i i stay away from pharmaceuticals i don't want them you know it would have to be very rare for me to take a pharmaceutical i mean the, the closest i get to a pharmaceutical is maybe the occasional ibuprofen or something <laughs> that would be about it you know Wow, that's that's amazing. There you go. A testament to what what exercise and what nutrition does for you and and others, individuals, we're all human, so it affects us the same. Oh yeah. I, I just think that's all, you know, crucial to good health. And and you know, I think with this whole COVID that's been going on, that has proven itself where, you know, a lot of people, either people who are deficient in vitamin D, they've shown a lot of those people are more susceptible or people that are significantly overweight, they're more susceptible. Or if you have some other condition, you are, are much more susceptible. So I don't feel threatened at all. Personally, I, I just don't feel threatened. That's amazing. That's so good. And I love that you said that. I love that because I say that and then everyone says, well, Mahalo, it's because you're young. But I love that, you know, someone um, your age or someone with your experience has said that. I love that. Absolutely amazing. Let's, well, let's... The, the other thing first, before I go, I just want to say, yes, tell me. my friends, a lot of them get a flu shot every year. I have never had a flu shot. I can't remember the last time I had the flu. I can't really remember the last time I've had a cold. I remember a few sore throats in the last few years, but I, cold, flu, no, don't remember. Well, the studies say that vitamin D is, uh, if not better than the flu shot. And I mean, if you're eating all those mushrooms, you may be getting some vitamin D out of that, right? <laughs> Well, well, yeah, 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 yeah. And listen, you know what's interesting because the, I'm glad you brought that up because, you know, the fact is that mushrooms actually do not have very good levels of vitamin D, but they have this compound in there called ergosterol, which when you expose mushrooms to UV light, it will turn into vitamin D2. And it's really cool. I just think, you know, it's, it's not too different from us where we, we have um, um, cholesterol, which when you, we expose it to the sun, uh, provides vitamin D to us. It's, it's basically kind of the same thing, right? Now, when you're in Australia, you're getting a lot more sun than, let's say, people in the northern hemisphere in the climates where, you know, we don't have the sun out all the time and we're not being exposed as much to the sun. So it's really a lot of people could be deficient in vitamin D. Yeah, a hundred percent. Definitely. Let's, let's get into today's topic that I'm so interested to in talk about why medicinal mushrooms can help you sleep better. I mean, not many people make the link between mushrooms and sleep. And that's why I wanted to get you on to talk about it because we know so many benefits about mushrooms with the immune system and so forth. But I wanted to get a little bit more into depth about mushrooms and sleep. But before we get into it, I wanted to know a little bit more about mushrooms. If you can just give us a bit of a history about mushrooms or the life cycle of mushrooms, because most I guess most vegetables, you have a seed, you plant it, here comes the vegetables. But mushrooms are different in this way. Are you able to expand a little bit more about the life cycle and mushrooms? Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, it's so interesting because you think, okay, I'm going to grow mushrooms. Well, wait a second. They don't have seeds. How do I do that? <laughs> <laughs> well, mushrooms have spores. Uh, um, the spores are on the wind currents. They're, they spread and they fall on the ground. They fall on wood. When conditions are right, which is generally a certain amount of moisture and humidity, the spores will germinate. They'll germinate into a very fine thread-like filament. And when multiple filaments fuse together, they will form a network. 
And that network of these filaments is called mycelium. Mycelium is what we call the vegetative body of this organism. Now, the mycelium is really cool because what it is is one of nature's recyclers. So it's, it's like feeding on all of that organic matter that falls to the ground every year. And it's like we, we would be like up to here in it without mycelium and bacteria and other things that are feeding on it and ultimately breaking it down into humus. So it's very important for the natural cycle. So this mycelium is out there uh, gathering nutrients in its own body and then when conditions change, and, and in this part of the world, it's in the fall, uh, the rains come, humidity goes up, up pops the mushroom, which we call the fruiting body. And that will take uh, maybe two or three weeks to mature. And as it does, it comes up, the cap expands underneath our gills, and that's what produces the spores. And so now we've completed a life cycle. So we've got spore, mycelium, and mushroom and what we would say is those are the three plant parts to this organism that we you know we commonly say oh it's a mushroom but it's got these different stages and parts to it and that's very important because when you're looking for an herbal medicine you know uh if it's ginseng it's the root if it's echinacea, it's the flower. If it's ginkgo, it's the leaf. The plant part is really important for the medicinal compounds. So, so now that we sort of established that, I mean, really, the, the thing is, is that, okay, so what plant part is going to be the best? In traditional Chinese medicine, they've used the mushroom. I mean, they haven't been able to use the mycelium because what do you do? Dig it up. <laughs> it's like it would be very difficult to dig it up. So they've used the mushroom. And the mushroom is like a, a bio factory. It is producing all sorts of interesting compounds. The mycelium is fairly simple in a way. Uh, it, the key thing it's doing is secreting enzymes, which is very interesting. Uh, to secrete those enzymes, to break down different types of wood and plants and uh, whatever organic matter out there. So different species will have different enzyme systems. So some mushrooms, why they're growing on a certain, let's say, a compost rather than wood. Well, it's the enzyme system that they've built up over all these years. And what's really kind of interesting is that most medicinal mushrooms grow on wood. What is it about wood? Well, not sure, but it's got the precursors necessary for these mushrooms to produce their medicinal compounds. And, and it's interesting because, you know, for example, something like chaga, it's got compounds that actually we find in the bark of that tree too end up in the chaga. And, and you know, just while we're on chaga for a second, chaga is not even a mushroom. <laughs> Have you ever seen a chaga? Yes, yes, I have. Oh, my God. <laughs> what is this? <laughs> Definitely does not look like a mushroom, does it? <laughs> no, no. It's this gnarly black thing, you know. And and actually, it's the, the thing about it is, is chaga is not even mycelium. Chaga is actually a manifestation of a fungal disease of this tree. It's, it's a canker. You know, so so what happens is this infected tree, as the mycelium, which has gotten into the tree and starting to colonize the inside of this live tree, it's a parasite, um, the tree will react and it will start to push out like it's trying to, you know, no, get out of here. I'm pushing it out. And it pushes it out. And next thing you know, it starts to form this gnarly black uh, um, growth. And if you pull it off, it's kind of got this black outer area, which is made up of melanin. And then the inner part of it is actually broken down woody tissue. But the amount of mycelium in there is only about 10%. So this chaga is not really even fungal. <laughs> it's, it's about 10% of a fungus. Uh, uh, but we call it, you know, we sort of call it a mushroom, but it's not really a mushroom. And uh, and it is used medicinally, which is which is interesting. And and it has compounds in it, which are called triterpenoids, which come from the wood and the tree. These triterpenoids, very interesting compounds, antiviral, which is 
Wow, that's that's pretty cool. And also, chaga has has uh, um, uh, immunological benefits as well. Chaga and reishi mushroom both have these triterpenoids, and reishi is the mushroom that I think of when you're talking about sleep. Um, reishi has got some pretty good research behind it that says it's calming. Uh, um, kind of lower stress a bit and and have found there have been studies showing that it can treat insomnia so if there was any mushroom out there that i would be using for sleep issues it would definitely be reishi mushroom and, and um i i don't i, I use <laughs> it's funny i use reishi in my coffee <laughs> in the morning <laughs> so so you know and that's kind of interesting too because in a way that um, that just goes to show you that these mushrooms can have different benefits and maybe are different for different people. So I, I would not use reishi in the evening. Uh, in fact, I don't really drink tea or anything like that in the evening. Whereas in the morning, uh, I like coffee and I will put reishi into my morning coffee a and reishi is bitter. Have yes. you ever tasted reishi? Yes, very bitter. Very bitter. And you see, that's one of the ways, too, that you can tell if you're actually got reishi because <laughs> it's so true. Out there, you might taste them and you go, ah, this is not very bitter. Actually, it tastes kind of good. <laughs> no, reishi, we would do what we called the reishi challenge at trade shows. And we have a little bowl of products that claim to be reishi but really aren't. And then we'd have our reishi extract and people would say, okay, try these. And they try the, the, this other product and they taste it. Go, oh, yeah, that kind of tastes good. I'm like, okay, <laughs> try this. And they, they try the reishi extract and, you know, the bitterness just kind of explodes in your mouth. And they're like, oh, give me some water, please. Yeah, and that <laughs> in like itself has many benefits uh, when you think about the digestive system, when you think about the nervous system. Yes. <laughs> Yes, bitters, right? A hundred percent. What happened to bitters in our Western diet, Mahela? We should need to have it before every meal to get those enzymes functioning in the gut and get them production and everything. We need those bitters. We do indeed. And instead, what do we get? Everything's got to be sweet, right? Sweet or salty. And, and it's like, well, yeah, I get it. I, I like salt too. And I do like sweet, but not in everything I eat. <laughs> we definitely need those bitters, 100%. So you were mentioning, talking about reishi, right? I, I, I love that. Reishi is also known as like the immortal, like immortal mushroom. By the, the mushroom Chinese. of immortality. Yes, by the, by the Chinese. They absolutely love it. And there's so much research done on this particular mushroom and it has so many health benefits. And I guess in regards to sleep, I guess the way that I see it being linked to sleep and correct me if I'm wrong, is that it actually modulates cytokines and modulates our immune system. And therefore it allows us to get that deeper sleep. Is there any other aspects that it can help with? Or is that, would that be one? Well, you, you know what? I mean, you're really talking too about the basic uh, activity of medicinal mushrooms. And that, that comes from the, the beta glucans in there. They are uh, immune system modulators or, or what I like to call um, potentiators. So they are, uh, um, they're something that we have receptors for beta glucans, which is interesting in and of itself. And that's a whole discussion to some degree that's out there about why we have these receptors and so on. But, but when we eat, uh, eat mushrooms and, and look, 50% of the cell wall of most mushrooms are beta-glucan, 50%. <laughs> so so um, when these beta-glucans, when they get down and they, these receptor sites are in the intestines and they get down and they will hit the receptor sites and that will stimulate the production of uh, macrophages, T cells, NK cells, and cytokine production. So, so you know, for me, when I, and, and this is one of the things too about mushrooms that I think is so important is that I look at them as, as food as medicine. Food is medicine. And, and that's why I'm always saying, eat mushrooms, 
before you supplement, eat mushrooms because they are one of those, you know, don't you think everything in our diet should to some degree be, be medicine? I, I mean, nutritionally, it's a medicine in a way, but if it had other properties and we're learning about like a lot of vegetables that have these really interesting compounds in them. So it's like food is medicine. Yeah, th that's the way it really should be. And that's how we should be approaching our diet. We want to eat something that is going to feed us nutritionally and medicinally. That's the optimal diet, in my opinion. Yeah, 100%. I, I say we look at our food as in how it's going to feed ourselves, not feed us. So the food that we're putting in us, what is it going to do to our biochemistry, not just to our, like, make us happy and have all that, um, yeah. you know, that that sweet food that you were talking about. It's just how, how do we feed ourselves the best? And mushrooms is definitely one way. Oh, they, they absolutely are. And, and you know, they, they've got such a great nutritional profile. And, you know, when I first started at the mushroom farm in 1973, the traditional uh, um, people that were nutritionists would say mushrooms are essentially a garnish. They're, they, they've got a nice flavor, but they've got no nutritional value. And the reason they said it is that mushrooms are low in calories, low in calories and actually high in fiber. So, so they're also feeding the microbiome. They're, they're a, a prebiotic. So, so it's a high fiber food locale the one of the the uh, carbs in there so it's so it's they're really a uh, high in carbohydrates but the carbohydrates are really positive carbohydrates like mannitol which is a very slow acting uh, uh carb slow acting sugar it, it takes i think the four times as long to get through our system than than a, let's say a potato or a, um rice or something like that you know again mushrooms do not have starch they actually and this is interesting too mushrooms have glycogen as their storage carbohydrate wow so do we it's like huh wow that's that's interesting i mean we we share certain attributes with fungi i was gonna um, say we're, we're really alike to fungi aren't we <laughs> more than animals in some instance <laughs> yeah yeah it's it's or an plants. interesting yeah it's an interesting <laughs> subject actually because because fungi also breathe oxygen exhale carbon dioxide and and like we do and so so we we do share certain attributes uh, um but again um the the uh, nutritional benefits and the fact that there's so much fiber there it's just you know really good food now now the difference between eating mushrooms and getting everything out of them and a, and a supplement would be one you know it, it's kind of like the difference between a potato skin and the inside of a potato in the sense the inside of a potato is like you know boom it's kind of like powder right so so and and it's kind of pre-digested in a way you know how uh, um so basically when we're eating a mushroom you know, most of us don't chew the way we probably should. So we can chew those up, but it's still a lot of fiber there. So generally speaking, when we take something that's been ground to a powder, we're going to have access to whatever's in there a lot sooner than we necessarily would. And that's where with supplements, that, that's probably something that we want, something, something that we are going to get uh, what's in there because we're taking a small amount with a supplement maybe we're taking a uh, thousand milligrams two thousand milligrams something like that so so uh, that powder it, it's just like you know surface area we can access that fairly easily but this mushroom that i have to chew up well you know it's kind of like eating a piece of meat how far can you chew that to really get everything out of it well nobody chews up meat properly right <laughs> Because we want to get on to the, the next bite in a way. <laughs> I was going to ask in regards to raw mushrooms, do we as humans have the enzymes to break down raw mushrooms or they're meant to be cooked? Do, do we have the enzymes to break them down? The well, raw well, mushrooms. You know what? Are we supposed uh, to eat raw? Uh, well, you know what? Um, I think that actually cooking mushrooms is, is a good thing. Um, mushrooms do have a compound in them called chitin. Uh, which is an interesting compound that that maybe makes up five to ten percent of the cell wall. So that's part of why we don't digest them and why why the fiber kind of moves through and we don't get enough out of them because of the chitin. Uh, and, and one thing that happens when you make a mushroom extract, and I'm talking about powdered extract here, um, is that you will be breaking down 
the kite and you'll be breaking down the cell wall. You'll make it a little more available. And I, I think that to me, you know, it's kind of like um, in Chinese, traditional Chinese medicine, you go, you get your prescription, you look at it, it's like all of these roots and all the rest, leaves, and you you know, it's like herbs, and you throw it in, and what, what are you supposed to do with it? Well, you're supposed to just boil it up. And man, have you ever seen those those uh, images of uh, sort of like the, the traditional Chinese medicine hospital, and they're making up medicines, and you see a stove, and there's like six pots, and they're all boiling like crazy, <laughs> and, and the liquid looks really dark, and you're like, oh my God. And people who would, would actually consume this would be like, okay, one, two, three. <laughs> <laughs> because Put it down. Like, yeah exactly so so you know i mean part of the idea there's look you got all this fiber in these herbs you, you're trying to get everything out of them so you're boiling it until you you've got pretty much everything out of all that's left is just inert fiber with plants it'll be cellulose with, with mushrooms now with mushrooms the fiber is still going to contain some of the beta glucan so you know we even make certain extracts where we leave the mushroom fiber with the product and and, because we think well the insoluble because the fiber for the most part is insoluble with mushrooms so well that that's okay that probably is still triggering some of those those receptor sites as well although we also do concentrates because you can't get eight kilos into one kilo and keep the fiber no the fiber's got to go so so and, and you know again we we only do um uh, powdered extracts and primarily because you know again we make all of our extracts in china we grow our mushrooms in china we don't want to be shipping a lot of water um and, and you know the, the thing too i don't know your opinion to be interesting what you think but we don't have a very high uh, um i guess opinion of little liquid extracts um probably because a lot of times what ends up on the market shelves is a lot more fluid than actually you know what you want uh, um, there are some companies like in North America that make really good strong liquid extracts and for me if, if that liquid extract that I saw in that bottle was clear I'd be like nah I, I would rather have it nice and cloudy and that's like exactly the one that I've got yeah solids right so that I know that there's still a lot of stuff in there not everything is dissolved and then, you know, you see what, what comes out and there's a little bit of residue in the bottom or something. And so, so for us, it's like, yeah, we, we want to definitely, you know, we, we feel like the powder, for example, one gram or two grams of the actual extracted herb would be a little better than a, a one ounce or two ounce bottle that's got hardly any, any of that in there. I get what you're saying, 100. percent You want the, um, you know, the, the 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 people to get the actual ingredients that mushrooms are, not the water, and then at the bottom of it, you just have the little things. Well, uh, well, yeah, exactly, because those liquid extracts are, are okay. They they always have to have a certain amount of alcohol as a preservative, mm-hmm. and then they have a lot of water in it. So you've got all of that fluid in there. When we make our extracts, we certainly extract them in water or water and alcohol, but then we we basically evaporate off the majority the fluid down to like a syrup and that's what we send off to the spray dryer to f- end up with a dried powder yeah yeah i absolutely love that before we get into more about how to choose the right um powder and things like that i wanted to go back to sleep and mushrooms from what i've read i saw that reishi lion's mane and cordyceps maybe the the mushrooms that can assist individuals with sleep what are your thoughts on that and how do you think they'll be able to help someone well you know what i i have to be frank in the sense that that sleep for me is like just one sort of arena that in a way is mostly as far as what i've read uh, geared towards reishi mushroom you know, the other thing I would say is like any kind of dis-ease, uh, um, if we've got a, a mushroom that is working on you as a whole and providing you with these immunological benefits, which basically means uh, you are more competent to deal with challenges or what's going on. And, and this kind of in a way speaks to the fact of mushrooms being considered adaptogens where they are looking that's basically non-specific in a way 
and, and that's that's kind of what I how I like to um, think of them. You know, and, and it's just kind of like it's not something where you're like, oh, I can't sleep. I better take this mushroom, and then I'm going to sleep good tonight. It yes. doesn't work that way. You know, it really doesn't. You have to incorporate them into your health regimen, whether it's eating mushrooms or supplementing them. You have to take them. Every- it's, it's kind of in a way like taking a vitamin, the way I look at it, because it's like when you take your vitamin, you don't the next day say, oh, God, I'm so glad I took that C. My cold is gone. You know, <laughs> took that vitamin C. It's all good now. No, that's not how it works. You, you really have to take them regularly. So, so like, like with cordyceps. The way I look at cordyceps is that it, it has been used traditionally for what's considered neurasthenia, which is you're, you just can't get, o- get out of this illness that you're in. You're just kind of tired. You're, you're fatigued. And, and, you know, actually, it's interesting because sometimes when you feel tired and fatigued, you might not sleep very well because of that. Or maybe you've slept during the day and then you go to sleep at night and you can't get to sleep. So, so cordyceps in that sense maybe is good for somebody that has got sleep issues. Um, so, so definitely it could be cordyceps. And, and you know, what's, what's interesting about cordyceps is, is the actual cordyceps that they used for thousands of years or what's the most famous cordyceps, which is the, the uh, uh, caterpillar fungus, is well-crafted. And, and it's worth $20,000 a dried kilogram. Whoops, I guess I can't afford that one. <laughs> and, and in China, it's only used now, only the rich people. They give it away as gifts and stuff. Nobody actually uses it. But we can grow cordyceps now. And, and it's a different species, but it's a species that's been used um, traditionally alongside of cordyceps sinensis, or what's called Orf- Ophiocordyceps sinensis now called cordyceps militaris it's really cool it's like bright orange and we can grow it and we can we can extract it and it's not expensive in fact they sell it in china in the food markets even you can eat this thing as food and it's delicious and you don't have to eat a caterpillar with it either (laughs) <laughs> that's the bonus i love that that's right that's right so so vegetarians it's all good <laughs> no, no caterpillar involved no caterpillar was harmed in the process <laughs> that's right that's right i mean it's it's fascinating to see they've got a lot of stuff on the internet about that where people are crawling around you know looking for this and then when they find it because a caterpillar is underground and so you're looking for this little tiny grass blade like like uh, black cordyceps and in fact, they call it winter worm summer grass because the cordyceps is kind of like a blade of grass. So they're down on their hands and knees. And when they find one, they dig around it and pull the caterpillar out very gently because that's part of this traditional herb is the caterpillar. Wow. So fascinating. I love nature. I love plants. I love I, that all just fascinates me so much. And I love, oh. the, I love the link that you made about I'm not taking this mushroom to sleep better tonight. I love that. And you mentioned adaptogens and how key it is for us to actually modulate our stress response, modulate our immune system to actually get a good night's sleep. So it's about what we do every day during the day to ensure that we're sleeping well at night. It's not what we're taking before bed to ensure that we knock ourselves out and get to sleep. Oh, absolutely. And and that in a sense too is why it's so important to get exercise because if you don't, a lot of time your body is still, you know, got, you know, it's kind of like still kind of charged a little bit. You haven't really released it to where you can really relax. And that's part of exercising is get to that point where you've, you, your body's gotten a nice workout and you can just sit back and go, oh yeah, this feels great. I, I really feel good right now because I've just had that exercise and my body's had to work and and it boy it's just like all the blood rushing out everywhere and and everything moving and and yeah that that's really a big part of it sometimes i think you know well look with with insomnia a couple things i think one of which is are you drinking coffee late into the day you better not be (laughs) and then are you getting exercise are are you at the point where you know for me when i go to bed I, i it takes me five minutes and I'm done. I, I'm, I'm asleep. <laughs> you know, my mate would always be like, 
oh my God, I hate you. you, you your head hits the pillow when you're asleep. And here I am trying to get to sleep. <laughs> so so it's, it's kind of like, like that. I mean, you have to be ready. That's why I never go to bed too early also. Going to bed too early. If I go to bed too early, I'm going to wake up in the middle of the night for sure. Uh, you, you know, so I, I'm I'm up, I'm up till probably I don't go to bed till twelve o'clock. I get up at seven. I get just kind of like clockwork at seven hours. That's kind of my sleep cycle, and that's always for me been just perfect. Sometimes I get up earlier. Odd times I get up late. I hate sleeping sleeping in. I just I'm just like, I don't know. I don't want to sleep in. I, I would maybe sleep in once or twice a year or something like that. I don't want to. I want to get up. I want, you know, besides, I, I'm always like going, mm, I think I can smell my coffee. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I absolutely love that. <laughs> what I found interesting while doing a little bit of study on mushrooms is that there was a recent research issue in February uh, 2021 that examined the addition of mushrooms to the U.S. Department of Agriculture food patterns, and they're currently considering adding 84 grams of serving to the dietary guidelines of 2025 to 2030. And that's about five medium white mushrooms. And they're saying in this study that you increase potassium, copper, selenium, a B2, B3, um, and it had no impact to calories, which goes back to what you were saying about back in the days, they just saw it as a garnish. Yeah. So what, are, what are your thoughts on that? In them saying that you, we should include about 84 grams, which is five medium white mushrooms to the dietary guidelines. And now is that per, what's the, the, like per week or what is the food pyramid well, saying on that? I'm not kind too of sure. Thing? It just said currently considering adding 84 grams of serving of serving to the dietary guidelines. Um, and it's at, at the moment, it's sitting with the advisory committee to be approved or not approved at 20 well, after 2030 died. Yeah. I'm, I'm shocked. It's taken them this long. <laughs> I, I am shocked because, you know, mm. and, and look, one actually one medium sized button mushroom i weighed it up not long ago and it was 40 grams one mushroom yeah I, I, you know look i can actually eat um 200 grams of mushrooms at a sitting without an issue at all i couldn't and, agree with you <laughs> i you agree know, with you 100 percent. <laughs> yeah well well not only that i mean i mean you know that that it, like with a button mushroom, especially you, you cut it up and then you throw it in the pan. And then all of a sudden you look over there and you're like, where'd they go? They shrink. <laughs> they shrink to half their size, you know? And, and one of the things I always tell people, put them in a hot pan. If you put them in a pan that's too cool, the water will come out of them. And now instead of the water being inside the mushroom, it's there. They're laying in a pool. They're wet. They're probably going to, your, your, your kids are going to say, oh, these are so slimy. I hate these things cook them up. I like to brown them on either side, but a hot pan is really, really important in that. And then, and then, you know, it's like, man, live a little, I mean, have a good amount of them, not just, you know, a small little bit there. I mean, again, as a meat eater and, and, you know, certainly Australians are big meat eaters. Holy smokes. <laughs> Could they live without their barbecue? And I, almost <laughs> at any time, almost any time, especially if I'm cooking beef or something, I've always got mushrooms with them and a pile of them every bite i've got mushrooms with that bite and, and uh, whether it's the button mushroom or a shiitake or a oyster or whatever i will eat a lot of mushrooms during the week i mean i probably eat i don't know it could be uh two to three pounds of mushrooms a week anyway and, and put it in the food pyramid absolutely and get rid of all that other bad stuff that you've got in this pyramid <laughs> <laughs> I would love to um, sit on that advisory committee and uh, got, see the guidelines, what's happening, what's getting added, what's getting removed. That would definitely oh, be interesting. <laughs> I would love to see you on that committee too. <laughs> and, and, you know, and look, no, go ahead. I was going to say, talk about mushrooms. It's awesome now that they've made mushroom burgers. Um, if you want to put that on your barbecue also. <laughs> no, absolutely right. You know, and also what they've, they've talked about too is like taking, um, if you're making a, a hamburger patty, well, put half of that. Uh, just chopped up mushrooms and put it, and I do that when I when I make a, a, a hamburger I will basically chop up some onions chop up some mushrooms and then I'll mix it all together with that uh, ground beef and put it on I never have a, a, a ground beef patty on its own it's always got mushrooms and onions in it 
Yeah, definitely. So talking about mushroom, the food, and we spoke about the powder, and we spoke a little bit about the tincture. What, how different is it if we take the mushroom as a food? And I know you said to eat the mushroom first before you take anything compared to the powder and compared to the tincture. What are the differences there? Well, well, you know what? I guess what I would say is that, is that um, if you're going to take a mushroom supplement, be sure you're taking enough. For example, I, I just told you that that uh, one medium-sized agaricus was 40 grams. It's 90% water. Let's dry it out. What do we have? Four grams of dried mushroom. So when you're supplementing, that's why what would one gram of just ground up dried mushroom powder be? It would be not much of anything when you think about that one fresh mushroom is four dried grams. That's why for me, I'm always like with our supplements, the fact that two things, one of which we have, we have broken it down, made it a little more bioavailable. Uh, we still got some of the uh, powder in it. We would recommend at least two grams of that per day. And, and we would look at that as like, okay, this is something that you're going to get everything out of because we have processed it in a gentle way. Um, we've processed it. So now it's going to be what I would consider to be quite bioavailable. It's not like you eating that that one, let's say one agaricus mushroom, and you eat it and and you don't chew it properly and it goes through and it's mostly fiber. <laughs> you know, so you don't get you don't get all the benefits out of it like you would with just uh, let's say two grams of the ground up powder as a supplement. And then, you know, we have concentrated extracts where maybe you would only need to take uh, 500 milligrams or one gram because let's say they're 10 to one. So a 10 to one extract means, okay, I've got five dried grams of starting material and I turn that into a 10 to one extract. Now I have 500 milligrams of a concentrate. So, so now I'm getting the equivalent of five dried grams of that mushroom, whatever it is, whether it's reishi or lion's mane or something like that. And it's interesting, uh, Mahela, because in Japan, they did some studies with lion's mane and, and what they used was three dried grams of lion's mane powder. So all they did, and they had a control group, they gave them lion's mane, they did a battery of tests after 120 days, they tested them again, the group that was taking the lion's mane did better than the control group, they stopped taking them, 30 days later, they tested them again, the one that did better dropped down to the baseline of the other group. Well, you know, it's, it's like 30 people in either group, and, and so you say, okay, it was a small study, but still kind of interesting. And, and, and again, my point being that they used three dried grams of the mushroom, which would be the equivalent of actually 30 grams of, um, of a fresh mushroom. So, so that's why I'm always saying, look, be sure you eat mushrooms because you might be getting enough eating them, especially if you're, eat, if you're eating 100 grams of fresh mushrooms, which is 10 grams of dried mushrooms. Okay, you're not chewing them well. You're not getting, <laughs> they're not digesting as much, but still 10 dried grams. Yeah, that's amazing. So definitely start eating those mushrooms and a variety, not just the butter mushrooms that we get at our local supermarket. Try and go into the Chinese supermarket or a health organic, you know, a shop where you can get a variety of mushrooms and explore, cook with them. I love the enoki and mushrooms cooking with them because they kind of look like little spaghetti things. Oh my God. I love enoki mushrooms. Aren't they wonderful? They're absolutely amazing. Absolutely love them. They look like little, yeah, they're just a like little, it's just awesome cooking with them. It's kind of like, oh, you make different flavors with them and all these stuff. You get so much out of them. Yeah. So for, so for the consumer that's going to buy a mushroom powder because they want to get the benefits from whatever it is from that mushroom that they want to get the benefits from, what's something that they need to look out for to get the best quality for them? Well, well, first of all, look, in, in the United States, there's a lot of companies that are growing mycelium and they're growing it on sterilized grain. And, and actually mycelium grown on sterilized grain is something that we've used 
as seed for growing mushrooms for uh, almost a hundred years, but and it's process that's in the lab. <laughs> and so what they do is they grow out this mycelium on the grain, and then they will dry it, grind it to a powder, grain is all, grain and all, and call it mushroom. So it's a not. lot of what it's not, <laughs> it's, it's not, not at all. No. So, so if you, if you see a mushroom product and turn it over into the fax panel and it says mycelium, I would avoid it. And number two, uh, here they have to, uh, uh, on a bottle of capsules or something, they have to, they have a little category that says other, which means other ingredients. Sometimes certain companies will say, okay, Myceliated grain, you know, the, the companies that are eth non-ethical companies that are ethical, <laughs> they're labeling, will say myceliated oats, myceliated rice, something like that. That's another, that's another basic tell that what you've got is this mycelium that's been grown on grain. And, and, and we've done a lot of testing for beta-glucans and what are called alpha-glucans. And alpha glucans are, are the starches or the glycogen. And we've shown that these products are, are rather than being 25 to 50% beta glucan, they're approximately 5%. And rather than being under 5% in terms of the alpha, which are the starches or the glycogen, they're 30 to 60% alpha, which means, again, they're mostly grain starch. And, and that is unfortunate. And so, so again, if the, if the, if the bottle toast is made in the USA, well, generally it's that product. And, and the other thing you can do too, is just, just dump out the capsule. If you happen to have one right now and you're going, oh, gee, do I have that? Dump out the capsule and taste it. What does it taste like? Does it taste kind of bland and flowery? Well, that's probably what you've got. The other really cool test uh, uh, is the iodine starch test. So basically a quarter cup of water, put in, you know, like if, if you've got capsules, put in maybe six capsules, dump it out, put the powder into the, stir it up in the water, get it nice and wet, and then put in 10 drops of iodine. It will turn black if you've got starch in that product. It's a cool test oh it's called the iodine starch test and it just has a reaction with starch and it turns the liquid black so you you can do this simple little test at home with nothing more than a tiny little bottle of iodine that is absolutely amazing that's mind-blowing i can see everyone being like okay i've got to get my iodine i've got to get my <laughs> test it out <laughs> it's like it's like our little home science project it definitely is. I love that. I love that you've explained to us how to get the best supplements and for us to get the most out of it as consumers, because we read these research and we understand that this mushroom is beneficial for brain health, for fatigue, for, for the immune system and so forth. But when we know that's done in a study, we also want to see it on us. So we want to get the best quality supplements, Absolutely. best quality powders. Yes, absolutely. The other thing, one of the things that we do too, is that we will um, put on our products and, and look, we sell raw materials to other companies and we also have a retail line, but what we do is we guarantee a certain amount of the beta glucans. So on our retail products, we will say, okay, uh, um, not less than 25% beta glucans so that you know and so so that would be the other thing that you could look for because a lot more of the companies out there including a lot of our customers are putting that on their labels and and, and you know look a lot of these companies selling these grainy products will in their literature say oh and mushrooms have got beta glucans and they've got this and they've got that it's like yeah, they do, but you're not selling mushrooms. That's the difference. <laughs> I love that. It's so true. It's so true. And this is what we need to educate more people on to understand that, yes, this is amazing, this mushrooms do, but some of the stuff is actually not mushrooms. Oh, I know. And, and look, that that's an issue that's uh, in the whole supplement industry. It's 100%. kind of an issue, uh, which is, is basically adulteration. And and it's it's something that we all have to watch out for. And you have to do your due diligence, talk to friends, talk to people, read up a little bit. Uh, there's a lot of misinformation out there and a lot of products that just will do you no good at all. 
But I guess if you're someone like yourself who absolutely loves mushrooms, you wouldn't just do it for the profit or the income. You have that history about mushrooms and you know what it does. So therefore you're going to provide the quality the quality mushrooms. You're not going to. Oh, just- oh, oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and, and you know, I, I mean, I mean, look, Mahela, think about this for a second. Back in the '90s, when I was still answering the phone for the company, you know, it's kind of a two or three man show, so to speak. <laughs> well, I would sometimes get a call from people that had cancer, and they'd say, "Hey, I've got cancer, and I've kind of at the end of the line, and and I've heard that maybe mushrooms might help. Can you imagine selling them starch powder?" I I certainly can't. I mean, I mean, wh- how could I possibly do that? It's you definitely like, it's wouldn't not- be sleeping well. <laughs> oh my God! No, no, no. I, I mean, look, and it's not just the the supplement industry. A lot of industries are like that. They sell you mm, stuff that's mm. not not good for you, um, simply because it's a business for them and nothing else. This is so much more than a business for me. I've been in the industry since 1973. <laughs> I want to provide people with good products. I don't want to provide them with placebos. Um, no, I want to provide them with a high quality product. And that's something that, that we do and we really feel is absolutely important. A hundred percent. And I absolutely love that. So now to wrap it up and all the information you provided us, what would you provide as some practical tips for in- people to include mushrooms with? If that is certain mushrooms at a certain time or certain mushrooms for something, what would be uh, pr- some practical tips for the audience to incorporate now, now that they know a little bit more about mushrooms? Well, well, you know what? I, I would say, first of all, if there's any one particular mushroom, if you're thinking, oh, you know, my, my immunity, I, I feel like, you know, I'm constantly getting colds or, or, you know, the flu too often or something like that. Well, well, try reishi mushroom. I, I think that is really the number one medicinal mushroom out there. So try reishi, uh, um, supplement with it, and, and be sure that you you know that it tastes bitter. And and, uh, and and then again, really for me, I just think look, there's a lot of ways to use mushrooms as food. So many different ways. They're so versatile. You can do anything with them. You know, really anything. And and um, you know, it, in Australia, a lot of people eating beef. Yeah. <laughs> try them with with your with your meat and try that hamburger that's half chopped up mushroom and and just think about all the i mean stir fries uh, eggs oh man and, and look shiitake mushrooms did now did you say do you have access to shiitake mushrooms yes we do get shiitake mushrooms they're delicious they're my favorite mushroom my favorite edible mushroom they're so delicious uh, and, and in china they're called shanggu which means fragrant mushroom and they have this this absolutely heavenly odor i mean it's just a beautiful mushroom flavor and odor and, and i would tell you know that is a true medicinal mushroom that if you're eating that regularly um Man, you are getting one of the top quality foods out there, fungal foods. So definitely uh, put shiitake mushrooms into your diet. If you like agaricus, do that too. But but really, you know, incorporate them in. And, and, and there's so many ways to use them. And, um, you know, that, that's what I say. Eat mushrooms and then reishi mushroom, the number one supplement. And then after that, you know, of course, you know, if you want to try lion's mane for, see if it uh, helps you cognitively. And don't underdose yourself. No, do not. I, I mean, think about it for a second with supplements. Why is it that every supplement tells you to take two capsules? <laughs> you know, it's like, why is there normally 60 capsules in a bottle and they tell you to take two? Well, very simple. It's a month's supply, right? So, so as a, as a, um, does a 150 pound person and a 250 pound person both take two capsules? No. <laughs> well, no, of course not. So, so think about that too. You know, really think about that. It's really important. So, so don't always just go with that, what they're telling you on there. Mushrooms are, are safe. They're, they're, uh, you know, it's like they're a food. They're also uh, have this medicinal value. So that's, that's what I would say. Thank you so much for sharing that insightful information with us. I can just imagine everyone's listening is like, okay, on the shopping list, I'm going to put shiitake down. I have to find recipes for shiitake and then um, hopefully getting some, you know, the other mushroom benefits with their supplements if they decide to go that way. I absolutely love that. 
So look, Jeff, to finish off, I ask all my guests, as this is a natural health podcast, what would be your best kept health hack? And if that's something that you do every day, uh, once a week, once a month, what's something that you do that really gets you healthy or, and, and a little hack that you do? Well, I, I guess for me, it would be getting outside and into the natural world because people get, you know, especially these days, people get trapped indoors uh, and people also sit too much. I, I'm lucky here. I, I've, I've got a property where I've got an old growth forth, forest and I'm also on the water. So I can take a walk right down to my beach and, and I can get, you know, so anytime. And, and one of the things I do is I get up all the time. I don't sit in this chair for long. <laughs> uh, I'm up every 15 minutes or something walking around. And then, then every hour or two, I will just go outside, walk down to the beach through my forest, breathe in the air, get a little bit of stimulation there, uh, get a little circulation going. That to me is, is uh, something that, that helps me out a lot during the day. And of course, most days, if it's sunny, I'll go out for a one or two hour walk. Yeah, it's underestimated walking and the power of nature of being outside and exposed to that fresh air and that oxygen. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, it's am amazing to me that now people are talking about, oh, yeah, we now are going to have groups and we'll take you out to nature to get you. You know, and I'm like, really? It's gone to that point where, where <laughs> we have to have others take us out to nature because we're so, you know, like, um, I guess far off and away, we, we just sort of like no longer have that relationship to nature. And a lot of people don't. And I find that disturbing. Yeah, definitely. And it's good that we are hopefully all going back to nature and walking and getting in touch with nature. So thank you so, so much for your time today. You've educated us a lot about mushrooms, about sleep, about the benefits of mushrooms and other ways and how to choose the best supplement. I absolutely love that. So I want to say thank you. Thank you so much for being on the show. And if anyone wants to get in touch with you or with your company and think, what is the best way? Well, come to namex.com, N-A-M-M-E-X.com. We've got a lot, I've got a lot of great slideshows there, how we grow our mushrooms and, and a lot of information about them. Or you can come to realmushrooms.com. That's the retail site. And we've got a ton of great content there. So come for the content, learn more about the mushroom world uh, from those two websites. Educate yourself about mushrooms. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jeff. Really appreciate your time. You're welcome, Mahela. It's just been great talking to you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for joining us on the Natural Health Podcast. And remember, the missing link between failure and success is your health. <laughs>